start now. Okay, so I, I will start then. Uh, let me present you just mm -hmm. then, then five seconds, short presentation. So, right. Uh, welcome everyone officially again to yet another seminar on the Wednesday nights of Petronets, although nights are getting brighter, COVID is getting weaker, and us researchers hopefully also getting merrier because of that. So I'm glad uh, to present to you our today's, tonight's speaker, Massimiliano Di Leoni from the University of Padua. Um, his talk uh, will be joining two dominating lines of the previous seminars. So multi-perspective pattern and formalisms and process mining. I know that uh, Massimiliano, you have been working on this challenging topic since many years. Okay. And uh, we all hope to hear tonight many interesting themes regarding both theoretical and practical developments in the field. So the virtual floor is yours. Please. Okay, thank you, Andy, for your nice presentation. Indeed, uh, I'll go through the work I've been uh, carrying on in uh, the topic of multi perspective process mining and recently on the verification of these models. Uh, so, so, since I'm uh, working on these topics uh, of BPM uh, and, and its the interplay with uh, AI since 2005, basically since my master project. Then after that, I, I couldn't stay far from that anymore. And these are different aspects that I've been touching upon in my career. We are, firstly, I'm not an island. Nobody is an island. So I want to thank all the collaborators with, which, with whom I worked and uh, whose results I'm presenting here today from Will van der Alts. Uh, Paolo Felli and Marco Montali from the uh, University of Bolzano, Felix Marder, a former uh, PhD student in Eindhoven, and also Ayer Ayers. Uh, this presentation starts from the belief that I, I hope everybody agrees upon is that all or most of BPM methodology technology are often driven by process models. And process models usually have two natures, a descriptive nature and a prescriptive nature. In a descriptive nature, uh, process models are used to discuss with stakeholders uh, how processes are being executed within organizations. So basically, you put forward the, the, uh, the specification of the process through a model and you start a discussion around the table with the stakeholders in order to agree upon the models of the process that you want to execute. Uh, and uh, this can also be used to formalize uh, how later the process can be implemented within uh, the organization. Models, however, have a, a prescriptive nature. Uh, they are used to, for example, as input for workflow management systems in order to enact those systems to work in accordance to the formal model that specify how the process is supposed to be executed. And there are several systems that do that like YOL, JBPM, Bonita Software, Camunda, and, and, many, and many more. And, but it also recently is gaining momentum, the use of a process model to drive simulations in order to discover uh, uh, bottlenecks, resource over or under utilizations and, and other aspects of the process in order to understand where the issues exist and later what kind of analysis, what kind of changes we can do what, uh, in order for the process to be performing better. So this, what is usually called a what if analysis. And also simulations requires a model that describes uh, the behavior. So you explain your behavior through a model. The model is put, giving us input at simulation software for business processes. And then you will run and you will collect all the information that you need in order to understand how the process is supposed to be executed. These models can be designed in a, uh, along with uh, stakeholders and you can obtain a model such as this BPMN model or, and it also is gaining momentum, you get an event log that uh, basically records the events executed within the world through software systems. 
So every event corresponds to execution activity within a process instance. And then uh, you can use the discovery techniques to come up with a model that summarize the main behavior observed in event log so that you know how the process is being executed. However, models are not necessarily precise, can be overfitting or, under, or can be underfitting uh, uh, the specification. Uh, so if a descriptive model, a model is used for description and is uh, imprecise, it means that we'll overlook uh, some aspects that are worth our attention. So many aspects will be removed. And so any discussion you want to do with the stakeholders to discuss how the process is supposed to be executed is going to end up superficially incomplete. Like in this picture, it's like you sit around the table, you just chat and people don't understand what you are talking about. The consequences are even more severe if the model is used in a prescriptive nature so, so that to, announce, uh, to enable a system and specify uh, how the system is supposed to be executed. If the model is imprecise, the system is clearly misconfigured. If we come back to the problem that I explained before, that we want to use these models to, do, to drive simulation, a simulation or imprecise, imprecise model is going to be incomplete or even worse, since it's imprecise that allows for too much behavior, you end up with conclusions that are not even true. So it's important then the conclusion is that it's important to make sure that the model is as precise as possible and allows exactly the behavior that the process is has to allow. Uh, and this explains why I'm going uh, to talk about multi-prospective process models. Uh, to, and I'll start with an example to show how this multi-prospective can indeed enhance the precision. Let's suppose that we have uh, these executions so we have a sequence of execution of four activity, A, B, C, A, B, C, and F. And each activity uh, updates certain process variables, such as the amount, the resource that is going to execute an activity, uh, and other information. So it's clear that if I take this execution, A, B, C, F, A, B, C, F, this execution looks like allowed by the model. But because this model is missing many perspectives such as data, decision, resources, time, and others, it tends to be, um, uh, tends to be not constraining enough the behavior. So now we take a more a multi-perspective model in which I specify the conditions uh, that drive uh, XOR, join, XOR splits I explain the roles the resources need to play in order to execute activities. And when I do that, uh, I realize that many things are actually not, many things observed in this trace execution are actually not allowed by the model. For example, here it says uh, that the amount is 3000. So I'm supposed to execute this specific branch. So after B, I'm supposed to execute D but I observe C. So it means that there is, this behavior is actually not allowed by the model. And other, other information can be constraints on the values that, uh, that activities can write. Uh, for example, interest has to be within a certain uh, interval. An interest of 530 is outside this interval. And there are others, uh, other type of deviations. So the message is that only if you specify this information, you are able to understand, uh, you can constrain and really stick to the behavior that uh, the model should allow. So once this uh, uh, introduction is given, I can go more and discuss the rest of my presentation and I'll focus on the multi-perspective process mining. So, and I will talk about how to do conformance checking of models uh, that represent not only the control flow, but also data resources, time, and, and other perspectives. And I will also touch upon uh, how to discover the decisions that drive the execution at the moment that you reach a decision points, also known as a XOR split. And of course, in order for multi-prospective process to be useful, you need to make sure that these models are sound, they are correct, don't contain deadlocks, live locks, dead parts, and so on. 
So I will touch upon the last research I've been doing on uh, verification of the correctness of models where different perspectives are represented. I will start on uh, talking about conformance checking. For those of you who are not familiar, I'll, I'll simply uh, uh, summarize what it is. Here I'm simplifying, I'm only focusing on the control flow, which means the ordering with which activity are executed. Let's suppose that we have a, a model that tells you how the process is supposed to be executed, the to be model, and then we have the execution that are occurred in reality. Conformance checking aims at verifying whether execution recorded in the model, sorry, execution recorded in the log, whether or not they are compliant with the model that specify what is allowed and what is not allowed. And for each execution, we'll pinpoint uh, the, the compliance. For example, the first one will be shown and will be diagnosed as compliant. The second is clearly not compliant because from A, we jump to F, skipping all this part in between. And the third that uh, repeats the loop once is also compliant. So conformance checking aims at diagnosing uh, deviations. If you now I go to the company and I just say to them, oh, look, this first and third executions are compliant and the second one deviates, the obvious question that everybody can, can imagine is that, well, that's okay, but uh, execution, just telling me that execution is or is not compliant is not enough for me. I want to know why and uh, where these deviations occur. So it's important to pinpoint the exact places where deviations occur. So I'm again uh, uh, overlooking the different uh, dimensions. I'm only focusing on the control flow. So if I have a trace A, B, C, E, F, it's clear that this is not compliant because after doing C, if I do E, and then I'm supposed to repeat the, to repeat B. So this, this is not compliant. And uh, so I need to pinpoint where deviations are. And the assumption I'm using here is that the best way to pinpoint uh, uh, deviations is to show which executions were, not, which activities were not executed when they were supposed to and which activities were conversely executed when uh, not supposed. So for example, here I can say, look, I forgot to execute, in th this execution is not compliant because I forgot to execute B and C. So the, the deviations here is the B and C didn't occur. Of course, there are many ways I can explain deviations. The other possibility is, to, is that, well, it's not compliant not because you, you forgot to execute BSC, but conversely because you executed once uh, E and you were not supposed to. Uh, so which one to take uh, here based on the assumption that uh, the correct explanation is the simplest one. So among these two, I will take this one because it's uh, the one deviate the least from the execution that I observed in my event log. So, so in other words, let's suppose that we have a, the log trace, the one uh, dotted lines on top, and we have the process model. The process model uh, means that we have a set of process executions, the, what we call here process traces. And conformance checking for me means that I want to find the process trace that is the closest to the log trace. So for example, this one, and then I want to pinpoint Okay, the non-conformity, the deviations are in, around this area. And these are the information that the stakeholders of the companies in which the process was executed are going to be reported on. And then, of course, you can do some root cause analysis to try to understand why these deviations are occurring. But this part uh, I touched in my research, but for the sake of time, I will not talk about today. Uh, for doing conformance checking, we need a simple notation, but yet powerful enough. Uh, BPMN tends to be a bit vague on certain aspects. That's why I used PetriNets uh, and I included some data. So we know this is a PetriNet. What I call a PetriNet with data includes variables uh, and uh, writing operations. So uh, transitions of my PetriNets can write uh, these variables. 
And then there are guards attached to the transition that need to be uh, evaluated to true in order for the transition to fire. So for example, in order for B to be executed, I need to have, a, of course, a, a token here, but I also need to make sure that X has a value lower than 10. Some guards, in my, uh, some guards can talk about what I call primed variables, such as this Y prime. This is talking about the post conditions of the execution of the transition. So this means that X, before execution of B, X has to be lower than 10. And after execution of B, Y has to be larger than uh, B. Okay, here is a typo. I think I mean X. Of course, in order to talk about Y prime, so the post condition over Y, Y has to be among the variables that I'm writing through transition B. So now let's take a trace. And now the tra a trace corresponds to the transition executions and the value uh, assigned to the different variables. And you will see that, okay, firstly, I, I fire S assigning Z value 10 and zero to Y. Then I execute A assigning X equal to one. Then I execute C and I say Y has to be 11. I observe that this is, uh, of course, this is not possible because in order to do C, uh, <coughs> X has to be larger than 10, but X is one, so it's not allowed. And then I can go on, uh, on and on. So here you explain that, uh, of course, transitions need to be, uh, can only fire if the preconditions are uh, evaluated to true. So now I don't want to limit, as I said, to say that there are deviations, but I also want to pinpoint which deviation I, I see. First, I observe that at the end of the execution, I, I have to execute F. So F is missing at the end. Then I observe that in order for C to be executed, X has to be larger to, than 10. So that means that cannot, X cannot be given a value one, but has to be at least 10. So let's assume, let's pick any value that it's okay. Let's take 10. Then I cascade, I will see that the value that white Y writes has to be larger than uh, the previous value of Y and 11 was okay. My e, in order for this condition to be true, 11 is not okay, has to be 20. And then so on and so forth. I can find uh, this, uh, this trace. I can say that this is uh, my, my, what I call alignment. This is uh, the trace that I observed in the log. And this is the closest trace allowed by the model. And then uh, by, uh, by aligning uh, uh, these two traces, I can find and pinpoint where deviations occur. This is uh, the first deviation and I'll call you as a synchronous move with incorrect right operation. This is what I call moving the process. And I'll explain you why it's called moving the process. And this is a good one, is a synchronous move with correct right operation. In this presentation, uh, in line with the, uh, with the terminology previously introduced in literature, I call move because you can imagine that each step of this alignment corresponds to something that moves. It can be that the, the process moves by filing a transition or the trace moves by consuming the next event in trace. Of course, the best is that they moved synchronously together and that's what uh, we expect. But for example, here, uh, it's only moving the process, the process uh, goes on, but the trace doesn't. Of course, many alignments exist. And uh, now I have to choose uh, uh, the alignment, uh, one of them. Uh, so we need to 
determine where misconformances occur. And this also depends on which are considered most severe. So the problem of, of conformant checking can be formulated as finding what I call optimal alignment. So alignment with the lowest cost. And the idea here is that uh, each move, uh, each uh, writing or wrong value is basically uh, it comes with a cost and I need to minimize this cost. For example, this has a cost eight because uh, write, writing uh, X wrong value as a cost here of two, then plus two is four, then uh, uh, another two is six, then uh, eight, and then finally this comes with the cost of two. So it comes to uh, eight. And then uh, we, we, you repeat for all of them. And for example, you find that this is the optimal alignment that comes with the cost of four. So how do I find this optimal alignment? I have my log trace. The first thing is that I do, I compute the control flow alignment using existing techniques. So only considering the control flow uh, thereby ignoring the data. Then I, the second step, I find, I reach the alignments with the, the data operations. And of course the alignment is enriched, thus minimizing the cost of the alignment. And this can be naturally formulated as a mixed internet integer linear program. So how do we construct this ILP? So the input is a control flow alignment that has been built with techniques developed by others in the state of the art. What I do is that I don't know this value. So each of them is given a different variable name. So Z1, Y1, X1, and so on. And then I, I impose uh, all the constraints that I encounter on the way. For example, the, the first constraint here, when, so when I execute, I execute S, then I execute A, then when I execute C, I, I read that the new value has to be larger than the old values, which is this constraint here, and then so on and so forth. So basically I map all the constraints I encounter on the way. And then I, I add an additional variables uh, to indicate, uh, say, if the value I signed, uh, for example, uh, uh, y2 is equal to the value observed in the log or, or is different. So zero means there is a, the same value, one if it's a different value. So for example, for the first uh, operation for x, I put a constraint that uh, this uh, uh, x1 is equal to zero uh, with a hat, hat x1 is equal to zero if x1 is equal to one. So now I want to minimize uh, the number of uh, variables with hat that have a value, uh, value one. So I want to minimize uh, this objective function where each, each variable uh, with hat is included. And uh, sum comes with a two in front because uh, the cost of writing a wrong value for y as a cost of two. So then I, cost, I obtain my ILP problem. This constraint that apparently is not a linear constraint literature says that can be rewritten as a linear constraints. And, and then I find an optimal solution, which will tell me which value to assign uh, to each uh, right of operation. So the value to assign to X, to Y, to Z in the, in the different moves. And uh, 
objective function, the value of the objective function corresponds to the cost. Plus, I have to add some cost for log moves and process moves. Let's take a second example now. And let's take the trace that we talked about before. And we have already seen there are a number of deviations here. And so this, of course, corresponds to the following data petri net. And then you will, you will see that, the, firstly, I, what I do is that I do the control flow alignment. So I, I align the control flow and later I add the data uh, in order to match as much as possible. But the fact that I impose to do control flow alignment before the data alignments, and I don't do them at the same time, uh, causes uh, uh, that the cost is higher than the actual optimal cost. So the, because I impose the control flow to be built in advance, control flow alignment to be built in advance. So the message is that that was my first work. I presented at BPM 2013, and that work had a, the issue that the solution were sometimes sub suboptimal. So I later worked on this topic and I went forward and I worked, uh, I went back and I studied A star, star algorithms to find the actual optimal cost. As you, some of you know, uh, it's, a, it's finding a solution in a search space. So I start uh, a I start from the initial state of, this, of the, my Petri net. I expand the status uh, with the least cost uh, until, and I go on exploring uh, each state, uh, the node uh, with the lowest cost until I find an optimal, uh, 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 until I find uh, the final uh, state. So a complete alignment. So this is the alignment, uh, I, this is the search space uh, for uh, finding uh, uh, optimal alignment of this. Each state corresponds to a, a prefix of an alignment. For example, if I pick uh, this node uh, corresponds to the alignment uh, in which I do a synchronous move on A. So log, I fire A in a model and I consume the, the first event in my log and then I, I, I do the second synchronous move B and B so and initially I, I obtain this prefix of alignment and then I reach with the right operations this way I can find a, a, a partial optimal alignment and I go on exploring the different states uh, until I find the optimal solution. The difference with the previous approach, the previous approach I was just firstly exploring uh, the optimal one alignment and then only computing the solution for the final state for what concerns the data alignment. Here I'm doing for each intermediate steps and this ensure optimal solutions. So this was a brief introduction to conformant checking for multi-prospective models. Now I will explain how to discover these models and I will focus on the decisions. So what is a decision? In a petri net, a decision is a place uh, that, allow, that has a concurrent or alternative transition can fire. So basically exhaust splits and they and basically these two transition Compete for this token. So that for me, a decision point. And I need to find what kind of rules exist to determine whether I go one path D versus tau, tau two. Because of course, models can also have invisible transitions. That means that if I think in terms of discovery, it means that there are execution or transition, they don't leave any trail in my log. So decision discovery requires one to, to, re to replay the trace until the decision point. 
and then reason on the state of variables and look forwards for what is going to happen next. So we need to do a replay onto the model, but traces uh, by definition, otherwise conformance checking problem would not exist. Trace may not comply. So the replay may be impossible. And then the other issue is that uh, replay requires you to, to also fire the transition that are invisible, which of, unfortunately don't leave a trail in my log. So the solution here is that firstly I build an alignment so that I find a replayable trace, uh, a trace allowed by the model is the closest one to the log trace, but it's replayable. And then it also includes the invisible transition. So I start from my log and from my model, the model corresponds to the control flow only and I need to uh, uh, reach the decision points with the guards. Firstly, I compute the alignments then I replay the alignments and I obtain uh, uh, the observation inch instances for each branching point for each decision point. And then I learn a decision trees that basically tells me and uh, this allows me to disc discriminate when one branch is taken over the others. Let's see an example. Uh, so here we have two decision points, the blue and the red. And let's see how I can learn the decision point, the guards at these, these, at these two decision points. Let's suppose that we have a trace, A, B, C, E. And the trace, uh, basically, this is about uh, applying for a loan. So at the beginning, uh, you ask for a loan of a certain amount. The length, for example, in, in terms of years of uh, your uh, loan. Then at a certain point, you retrieve the applicant data. So you provide ages, information about your salary. In parallel with retrieving this information, you compute installments. And then here, you decide at the end to approve. So basically what you are doing here, you are following this path. So here you go parallel, then you merge, and then you continue this way. So now I need to learn uh, the, the guards using this information. First, I compute the alignments, the control flow alignments. I cannot compute the multi perspective because the model only contains control flow. And, I, and then I observe that when I reach, uh, the, for example, the blue decision points, the amount of, has been 8,500. 8, I do the typo here, installment is 750. The salary is 2000. The age is 25. The length of the, it's two. In this condition, I went for a tau two. And similarly, in the same conditions, for the red decision point, I went for E, so I, I went for E here. Now let's take a second trace. In the second trace, I actually uh, omit information about uh, the amount. The trace didn't, con didn't contain this information. So there will be a moving model. So I will only fire the transition without consuming events. And I can say that in these conditions, I, when reaching uh, this decision point, I fired T2, uh, tau two. And when reaching this decision point, I fired F. And I can go on for a third one. So in this case, because I follow with this path, because I, there was a rejection, I can only add an instance to the training instances of uh, these decision points. And I save this for third instance. And in these conditions, I, I execute the task D. Now I, I focus, for example, on, one of, on the red decision points. So I know which task was executed in each condition. And then I apply decision tree learning algorithms 
uh, for example, I can obtain a decision tree such as this. And I see that, uh, for example, that uh, in two cases, uh, the model is uh, learning that, that the simple application is going to happen. And this can correspond to the, the following guard. So if amount is less than 10,000 or amount is greater than 10,000, but the age is less than 35, I, I do approve simple. I do complex applications when uh, uh, amount is larger than 10,000 and age is 35. So this way I can, I can manage to discover decisions. But let's suppose that uh, the actual decision I want to learn uh, is the installment larger than salary. Decision tree by nature cannot discover such a guard, variables, operator variables. So you will try to uh, make rectangles, uh, squares out of this and your decision miner will return impossible to read guards. So the decision tree alone are not able to discover guards that co confront, compare to variables. So then I, I work on this problem. I use the tool that's called Daikon that allows to mine likely invariants. So I took my instances and I apply Daikon, which is a tool for using in dynamic, dynamic analysis of software to like to discover likely invariants. And I observe that among these instances, these rules uh, sort of uh, uh, a priori rules are observed. And I use them uh, as features of my, of my for learning. So I convert this table in a table in which the features are not the single variables, but are these conditions. And now, all the, and now I build the, the second table. And I use for the, again, for decision learn uh, tree learning and obtain uh, different decision trees, which also can be converted into decisions. But now you see the conditions are not anymore of type variables, operator constant, but combination of variables. Now to showcase uh, the practical applicability of this, I report on a case study made by Felix Mannard while doing a PhD, while being PhD students in, in, in Eindhoven. And it's about sepsis. Sepsis is a life-threatening condition that allow, arises when the body uh, is a, response to an infection caused by injuries. So for example, you, uh, the, the body basically combat, uh, fights against the body itself. And this is very life-threatening. And if you don't give antibiotics very quickly, uh, the mortality rate is very high. So Felix conducted a case study in an hospital in the Netherlands that deals with 5,000 patients a year. So it's quite a large hospital and uh, 1,500 patients uh, in a period of 18 months were dealing with sepsis. Fortunately, what is not such a common case. And the hospital uses uh, an ERP system so we could extract event logs on how sepsis patients were treated within the hospital. Of course, uh, process mining uh, in, uh, is driven by questions. So they ask uh, Felix, uh, uh, whether the, um, the international protocols were followed in the hospital. In particular, international protocol says that the antibiotics need to be given within one hour. And you need to measure the lactic, lactic acid level because apparently there is a correlation between the high levels of this acid and uh, severe cases. And the second question was that once you decide to hospitalize the patient, uh, what, what, is the, what are the criteria to decide whether he goes for normal or for intensive care? And what are the conversely criteria that says, okay, the case of sepsis is quite, uh, is quite light, so the person doesn't need to be hospitalized. <coughs> Fortunately here, we were in a good condition. They had a, 
documents that explain the, the protocols that the, the hospital was followed, following. So we got some kind of flow chart explaining the process that was supposed to be executed in the hospital. This was converted into a PetriNet with data. You observe there are also variables uh, written by transitions. And then we encoded some uh, uh, expressions to make sure that antibiotics are indeed given uh, every, within one hour. A lactic, lysis, uh, lactic acid is measured within three hours. And the conclusion of doing conformance checking is that, uh, unfortunately, only for 78% of the patients, the antibiotics were given instead of 100%. And uh, the antibiotics were supposed to be given every hour, uh, within one hour from the moment the patient arrives at the hospital. But actually the average was one hour and seven, one hour, 1 1.7 hours. So these were two important cases of deviations from the protocols. The second question was, uh, what criteria does the hospital use to choose uh, uh, if going, if uh, hospitalized in normal or intensive care or no admission? To answer this question, we build, uh, uh, we use this simplified model. At a certain point, this model has a uh, exclusive split that decides whether a execution continue intensive care, normal care or no admission. And then we discovered uh, the guards at this decision point. And basically the guard says, if a lactate, so this acid le level uh, was uh, uh, larger than zero, then people were hospitalized in normal care. If uh, the less or equal to zero, uh, the, the person was not hospitalized but sent back home. The first thing that clearly strikes out is that this decision point doesn't give any guard for what concerns intensive care. If this is happening because uh, they were, all the intensive cares were classified wrongly as a normal care because decision points expects that to, to find these joint guards. So it expects that the guard assigned to intensive care is different from the guard assigned to normal care. But the reality is not so deterministic. Uh, so the, the same patient, uh, uh, so two patients in the same condition can be sent to intensive care or normal care depending on uh, other consideration that are not mapped into the data. And the other thing is that uh, decisions are, are of course driven, decision discovery is driven by information within the log. If uh, the, the actual guard depends on information that is not present in the log, you know, there is no way to discover this. This brings me to the important uh, aspect is that guards are often overlapping. So the, the, in the, when you reach this decision point, uh, in the same condition may go either to intensive care or to normal care. So then we develop uh, a technique that we applied in this case, but where it's generally applicable in any case in which you cannot find uh, uh, disjoint guards. So the idea is that we took uh, all the wrongly classified cases uh, in normal care. And on those, we applied again, decision discovery. And then we, we find out that the decision of whether inside here, there was some decision driven by hypotension. So if your pressure is, is low, then you go to intensive care. If your pressure is normal, you are sent back home. So if la now going back, this means that if lactate is less or equal to zero, you are sent back home is this case. If lactate is larger than zero, patients were uh, hospitalized in a normal world. And then uh, there was a second decision tree uh, that was learned on the wrongly classified instances of the first, 
we found that if the, the, there's a high potential, so low blood pressure, then you go to intensive care. But you, vice versa, if your pressure is normal, you go back home. So this shows the importance of uh, uh, discovering uh, overlapping rules. I don't go too much into the detail of how this is computed. For more information, I invite you to read the paper shown here. The last point I want to touch here today is uh, verification and importance of, uh, importance of soundness. We, uh, we know from uh, literature that unsoundness means that there are deadlock and live locks in my model or there are some dead portions in it. So part of the model is never actually reachable by any execution. So this, if the model is unsound, in the light of what we have seen so far, if the model is unsound, it becomes impossible to conform and checking. The conform and checking requires you to find the closest execution in my model. If there is a deadlock, it might be that there is no execution possible by the model. But even if there are, the analysis might be incorrect because of, because of the issues of, the, of deadlock or dead portions. And if these models are unsound, and you use information system to be instructed by this model, it's clear that the system can enter into deadlocks. Here we are talking about multi perspective. So now we are talking about a Petri net. Uh, with a set of variables. So now a state of a Petri net with data is basically is the marking that has been uh, is the marking plus a function that assigns uh, a value to each variable. For, we start from here, for example, you can reach these two states and you can go on until you reach uh, your final state, which is basically uh, putting a place in your final marking, sorry, putting in place in your final place with some variable assignment. Such a Petri net in which the state is a combination of a marking and function that assigns variables to vari uh, values to variables. The concept of soundness is not that different. Uh, for each possible state, uh, marking a plus uh, variable function is possible to reach uh, the final marking with a token in uh, with one token in the final place, no matter what is the value assigned to to the variables. If you reach is the same concept. If you reach the final marking, if you reach the, uh, the a marking in which there is a token in no no other places. Uh, have a token, no matter what is the function, uh, the variable assignment. And of course, the third one is the same as in case of soundness, PetriNet. So there are no dead transitions. So how do we do this verification? Let's, uh, let's take this fragment. We use uh, initially a technique. The first approach that uh, uh, we explore is to convert this PetriNet with data into color petri nets and then uh, later use off the shelf verification feature in CPN tools and in other tools for uh, verification of color petri nets uh, directly. So how we do that? It's transition of a data petri net becomes a transition of the color petri net. The variables become additional places. For example, here we are a variable amount it becomes an additional uh, place with one token and, uh, and then a variable OK, which corresponds to the second variable here, OK. The, every time I write a variable, I could, uh, I, every time I write a variable in my data petri net, I update the corresponding place of my color petri net. For example, here I'm writing a value greater than zero so I consume a token and I produce uh, back a token uh, with a new value and so on and so forth. 
for example, for renegotiated, uh, renegotiated request, I'm just reading uh, the value. And also I'm reading uh, uh, the value from amount. And then the condition is basically the same as in the data Petrinet. Of course, uh, in general, uh, uh, variables can be defined over infinite domains that makes the verification undecidable. So the idea here is to is to focus on a situation in which con the conditions uh, of the of the uh, of the condition of the different transition are always on the form of variable operator constant. For example, x is greater than five. In this case, the infinite domains of the CPN. Are, can be discretized using, rep, uh, using representative values. So, for example, if I, I go back and, and, I, and uh, I want to find the representative for amount, I look at my PetriNet and I observe that this, the following guards, guards ref referring to amount. So I, I collect all the constants I observe there. I sort, uh, so it's 5,000, 10,000, 15,000. And then I take a representative, so values within this interval. So I take a value smaller than 5,000, for example, 499, a, a value between 5,000 and 10,000, 5,001, and so on and so forth. So these are the values that are representative. So the values in the conditions in the net and the value and a representative in between. And I add an additional place in my color petri nets with these values so that basically a credit request can only uh, write these values. And now basically everything becomes decidable because uh, uh, these infinite domains amount is converted into discrete domains with only seven values. And uh, it's easy to see, uh, to prove that the, the data petri net is sound if and only if the corresponding color petri net uh, with representative is sound. If uh, the CPN tool is unbounded, it can only be, can still be unbounded because of a control flow, not because of data is not sound. If it's bounded, then can still be unsound. So I need to compute the reachability graph to check this. But the reachability graph is going to be finite because the, the net is now bounded and defined over discrete domains. Of course, this has the limitation uh, that uh, guards need to be in the form of va variable operator constant. Uh, in, uh, and this, of course, is a limitation. And also, the variables need to be, I can discretize uh, variables even on the infinite domains, but they need to be continuous because I need to take a representative in between two values and I have to make sure that there are there is a value in between. For example, integers are not is not possible in our approach because if I if I have to take a value between four and five, of course I cannot take a representative in between because there is no integer between four and five. Now I will show the last is a I can I can remove. Uh, the limitation there has to be variables operator constant and I allow uh, atoms in my guards that are of the type variable operator variables. So I'm now allowing for guards such as B is smaller than A. So the idea here is that I want to build a finite representation of the infinite uh, reachability graph of the data petri net by merging together states that are somehow similar. And now we'll explain you why and how I will do that. The first thing I do, and I will explain for each transition in my, for each transition, for each place, if, if for, if for each transition, 
I, I add an invisible transition. There is uh, there has a guard. There is negation of the guard of, uh, observed. So the, I, the negation of, of a transition T two is an invisible transition tau T two with guard a smaller than ten. The neg uh, this, the, the negation of this transition is of course a transition with a larger than or equal to ten. And the negation of the transition T4 is, of course, a transition with opposite guard. Uh, why I'm, I'm adding this additional transition is that because I want to play somehow, how to say, a devilish behavior. I want to try to behave a devil and try to make sure that the model is not sound. So I will do my best to, to play against the model. So I need to, to have a, the negative case. So I start from this model and I build what I, we call a, cost, uh, a constraint graph, which is a final, this final representation of the data petri net. Each state on my constraint graph is composed, is a pair, uh, is the marking that has been reached and the system of conditions over the process variables that hold in this state. So the constraint, blast, uh, constraint graph can still have infinite many states because uh, of course this, uh, the, the petri net can be unbounded for what concerns the control flow. That's not a big deal. It's easy to check uh, unboundness on, on constraint graphs in the same way that you, you check unboundness of a petri net. Uh, if it's bounded, the, the, the constraint graph is, cons is uh, guaranteed to be finite. And then I can uh, then uh, verify uh, possible deadlocks. And for example, if I can go back here, I observe this path that leads to a deadlock. Basically, we are not, we are, it's a deadlock because I've not reached by end marking. And that's the case when A is equal to 10. Indeed, if A is equal to 10, for example, if this write 10, then I execute this. Uh, the initial value for B was 10. So this condition doesn't hold. Uh, so basically execution stops here, cannot progress if A writes 10. So we have reached a deadlock. As a such, this data petri net is not sound. So with, with this, I conclude. We started by saying the process models need to be, uh, are useful as much as they are accurate. And we somehow suggest here, uh, advocate multi-prospective models as a way to enable higher accuracy. Uh, multi-prospective models then can be used for a more accurate conformance checking because now I can check the conformance with respect to the decisions, uh, resources, time, and so on. Multi-prospective models can be discovered uh, once I have a control flow backbone. So here the idea is that firstly, I discovered the control flow uh, using uh, uh, standard algorithms such as uh, inductive minor, listing minor, alpha minor, and so on. And then I reach this model with the information about the other perspectives such as the guards. In this presentation, in, uh, we show how to enrich uh, uh, the model with the decisions. I also worked uh, on how to e extend the model with respect to other perspectives such as resource time, et cetera. These perspectives are also discoverable, and this paper actually illustrates it. And then we saw that we show that every model to be useful has to be sound, otherwise it leads to consequences. And we, I, we show some techniques to, to check, verify the correctness of multi-perspective models. Okay, this concludes uh, my presentation. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Massimiliano. Thanks a lot.
you're welcome. Um, that was really, really, really nice and interesting presentation that really touched a few, a few aspects also, also very different things like like verification and and uh, performance checking. Although maybe for someone those would be very similar. Um, so let's see whether someone has already questions to ask. So while, while probably people are thinking, I, I would like to ask you one thing that is uh, related to the conformance checking side. So when you're talking about cost functions, um, the type of the cost function you were, you were considering there is the one that essentially looks uh, whether data values are the same or they are different, right? So pretty much just do the quality comparison. And that would essentially assign the penalty, right? Correct. But what if uh, you somehow become even more fine-grained and you try to employ, I don't know, say constraints uh, that, that you have in your model and that you start also looking into particular data types and based on these data types, you are, uh, assigning penalties say like if you're having two values which are different from each other let's say integers you would essentially assign as the penalty not just uh, one but you would assign the difference you get or maybe normalized difference i don't know amongst many others that you can also get in your traces okay, okay. yeah this is something I, I, something that at the beginning i thought of because the model can be very easily extended towards comparison for I mean, in case of integers saying uh, the, the farther the values are, the more is the cost. That's what you meant, you mean, yeah. correct? Yeah, precisely. Uh, yeah. Then I thought, I said, uh, uh, are we sure that the, the difference between uh, 10 and 100 is more than the difference uh, between 10 and 11 or better? Uh, can be that the 10 and 100 is, is, there is firstly, there is not a linear co correlation between, uh, uh, the, between the values. Then one can say, yeah, well, I just forgot uh, at zero. Uh, it was a typo when I, when I fill it in the form. Uh, it was an information that, uh, okay, it was, it's very, very hard to say that uh, the, what, the nature of the alignments, what the nature of the deviations is. Uh, it's not easy to say that the difference between 10 and 100 is more than the difference between 10 and 11. Uh, so I decided to avoid all this detail because it's really, um, may somebody say that, well, it's just a typo, I forgot the zero. Uh, Something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Probably, but but what what if you if you have more information about your domain, right? So I don't know what what could it be. Maybe one could even think of mining this kind of information from the log, perhaps. Yeah. So so trying to understand what are the constraints there, and and uh, probably you you might have outliers and you can just discard them, saying that okay, those outliers are essentially insignificant when I want to assign uh, the penalties, but then still you could have like a range of penalties, which, which would be more meaningful and more fine grained. Although I don't know whether this at the level of conformance checking would actually make sense. Uh, so my experience is that uh, I never get to, into requests of uh, this fine granularity. Uh, okay. Also, it's very hard to discover it directly from data because this is really domain knowledge and it's only domain uh, knowledge knows somebody from the stakeholders can understand whether, well, uh, 10 and 100 is more severe than 100 and 101. Uh, it's difficult to extract this information from the data. It's really, the idea of the cost function is that this is something that is provided by, by the user. Another problem okay. here, of course, is that the users may not have no clue how to provide this cost function. 
And so here, I think there is a lot of nice research is to try to facilitate this from a business perspective. Uh, instead of talking about numbers saying, or for example, ordering, uh, for example, say, order severity uh, and, just, and then uh, behind the scene assigning a cost. Uh, because uh, I can imagine that somebody, a CEO of a company would never be able to understand uh, and to provide this information. Furthermore, I remember the, the case study with the hospital that Felix uh, Manner did. And I remember that this, uh, this, this the assignment of the cost was something that was done little by little. It's a bit like when you do a machine learning project, you, it's iterative. You firstly do that, you go back, you introduce a new feature, you, you remove some obvious features, so on and so forth. Also for this, it was important, it was doing conformance checking, then coming back, changing the cost function because the alignments didn't make sense uh, and so on and so forth. So the my feeling is this cost function is something very powerful, but requires a few iterations, also including the stakeholders to find a way to tune it because a, a small change in the cost function can lead to huge differences in the alliance that are built. All right. So, so the, your your take on it is essentially that the construction of the cost function should always be supervised. I think so. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's that's actually very interesting. Danny, I think is a nice field of directional research uh, to find a way to provide this cost function in the way the users can uh, really uh, have, provide. Right. Yeah. Probably, if you if you force the uh, the main experts to put a little bit more effort on describing their knowledge domain, that probably could be also helpful because I think there are, there are lots of ways of doing it. Yeah. Okay. Nice. So, uh, other questions? I heard. I have a question, and um, so uh, the, the the data. So all, all uh, perspectives in in uh, these multi-perspective process models are um, related to some type of data. And uh, here, uh, so in your examples, there were um, um, data as uh, some numbers and data as some um, uh, logical values, yes? And uh, like uh, true or false values. Uh, uh, what about um, using some, I don't know, object-oriented data as, as, as uh, um, uh, variable types? And uh, uh, would it be useful for for some applications, would it be uh, how to say uh, feasible? I, th I think you can use uh, of object-oriented data, but I would also be interested to know. Uh, yeah, it can increase increase the complexity uh, because uh, it depends on what kind of operations you you allow or what kind of guards you allow on this. Uh, object-oriented data. Because uh, if you start allowing operations that are more complex, maybe it may not be possible anymore to compute alignments. Because one of the assumptions I put here, and I didn't mention, is that guards for conformance net, uh, checking needs to be uh, linear uh, these equations. Mm -hmm. uh, no, you cannot, uh, yeah, you cannot, you cannot, because internally, as I said, it becomes an ILP problem. Guards become the conditions of the ILP problem. And ILP can only deal with linear inequations. So the constraint here is linear inequations. So you can add object-oriented data as, and use that in conformance checking as long as it can become linear inequations. One possibility might be some that you can uh, depends on the data. Let's say. Okay. Object okay. oriented uh, is okay. Ob objects are okay. 
it's the co constraints that you put that was limiting. So my feeling in general, but I never have uh, intuition uh, to just a feeling and I don't have proof is that I think uh, you don't have to, of course, in general, conform and checking on guards of any type is an undecidable problem because, I, because if I can put any guard uh, and I try to solve, uh, if I can find an alignment, it means that the, pro uh, the problem is decidable. And then I would be a genius because I've solved the ultimate problem, uh, if I can do that. Uh, of course, that's, there is a limit in the guards you can express. The, if the model is too incomplete, I cannot do conformance checking. Uh, it would be interesting as a future work to understand what kind of guards make uh, the conformance checking decidable. My intuition is that it has to be an invert, uh, invertible function. Mm. Not necessarily a linear function it has to be inver invertible. Uh, but I don't have uh, any proof for that. So the, coming back to your question, okay, object oriented, but has to be uh, depend on the type of guards more than the type of objects. Furthermore, I must say that if you think about the standards in uh, BPM standards, uh, uh, they are just already quite have an issue to deal with a, a simple uh, variables of this type. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So uh, um, then the so uh, then the uh, in answering uh, this question, we we are uh, came back to 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 domain experts because they um, they define this type of guards and type of. Yeah, problems in, in some sense. Yes, I think so. I think conform and checking in general is driven is very much driven by uh, the stakeholders. Those are the guys they have to provide the two B model uh, to do conform and checking. Okay, thank you. Maybe just just a follow up question to what uh, Alex was saying. Um, the the thing that you were saying about the the property over the function that you would use uh, in the guard expressions. That is probably also linked to the algorithm that you're using, right? So if you consider not using A star, but something else, knows how would it work, right? Yeah, so it's possible. Probably, this is probably just within the context of, of the A star. So, yeah, more than A star is not A star, the LP, you mean? Oh, yeah, right, right. Yeah, the LP problem I had to solve it, for, yeah. for yeah. sure. This limitation is because of the technique I use. That's why I feel that I can do more uh, than this. Yeah. The thing is that the problem is, uh, is not really important to have. Probably also approximations of guards can be fine. For example, if you have, if, if I have a guard that talks in terms of a quadratic functions that you approximate a, uh, as a linear function in some way, uh, and you don't get an optimal alignment, a suboptimal alignment. It's probably it's fine. I'm, yeah, but depends exactly depends on the algorithm. That's why I feel that there is some, you can push the board the boundaries beyond linear these equations. Thanks. Other questions, oh, Sara? I think. Yes, I would have a question. Uh, with respect to this decision discovery. Yeah, sure. So you mentioned that you first, uh, given your log, you first compute conforming traces for all of the uh, conforming process runs for all of those traces. And then you apply decision tree mining techniques and invariant mining. So could you, instead of the second step using decision trees, perhaps again, use an optimization approach. If you say you fix for one transition, the template of the guard. So not the, so say you have a threshold expression, but you don't know the constant, or you have a plus a times x plus b times y greater c times z, something like this. And then you op you solve an optimization problem that optimizes that minimizes the sum of the of the distance that you get for all your traces with respect to this um, this uh, parametric guard expression. And then you could get values that fit your traces best. Do you think something like this could work? And perhaps avoid this problem that you, because I think in the decision trees, you always have um, 
um, decisions that are exclusive. So you either take the one or the other. Yeah. So maybe if you do an optimization problem. Yeah, I think it, it can work indeed. So basically, you again you go towards finding invariance more than this, uh, discriminating rules. Uh, so you have, Perhaps, you find yeah. templates and then you 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 optimize for the template that is the closest uh, that fits the best the data. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it's possible to do that. Uh, one risk I can see is that uh, this guts. Of course, the guts can be more complex than single expression. It can be a conjunction, a disjunction of atoms. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, when I, in my presentation, I talk about this daikon that I try to use to mm -hmm. discover some invariants and then to feed them into decision trees. The, uh, why at the end I didn't stop uh, to invariant uh, miners, but I, later I still use the decision trees because uh, the, my feeling is that this uh, invariance uh, tends to discover too many guards. Uh, you actually want to restrain yourself, constrain yourself to only those that are most relevant, which in my interpretation are those that discriminate a branch over the other. Uh, nonetheless, I think, uh, so that's the problem I remember, I, I remember from Daikon is that there were too many invariants and that if you get too many, you need to filter. And then decision tree, the second step was meant for that. But I think for the, I think decision trees are still useful for the second step. But of course you need to feed the good templates and then I think optimization can help. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Okay then, so if we have no one else, we probably could call it a day. And uh, Ms. Mariana, thanks, thanks a lot one more time for accepting the invitation. Thank you. For, for presenting. Thank you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure to present here, waiting for the time where we can finally, I can present it live and not uh, Two avatars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We're, we're. I think we're all looking forward that time. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. probably a year at least. Yeah. Wait, and then. Yeah, let's hope. Yeah, soon. yeah. I'm being too optimistic. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot again, and uh, hope to see all of you during the next sessions. Uh, we will continue still for a few more weeks. Great. Thank have you. A uh, have a good nice evening. Thank nice. you for being here. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you again, bye. Hey, evening.